there is a tendency among us folks of the weebier persuasion to have a certain longing for other times, particularly medieval or steam eras, and Japan is much the same. Everyone, from grade schoolers to old folks, have some nostalgia for a period they were never alive, particularly Japan's feudal eras. And Japanese media is full of this sort of stuff, from the eternally running tiger drama, which as an aside is apparently cursed, seriously look into it, it's kind of amazing, to oodles of movies, video games, and more. The days of silly hats and even sillier haircuts really do loom large in the collective Japanese unconscious. Of course, the image people have of these eras being times of chivalry, honor, and adventure aren't all that connected to the realities of said periods, which were in actuality filthy, nasty, brutish, blood-soaked, and full of horrific injustice, inequality, and suffering. And that brings us to today's topic, Shigurui, translated as Death Frenzy, although it combines the kanji for death and the kanji for going crazy, so it might be more along the lines of berserk. I wonder why they didn't just call it that. Oh, and this did get an anime release apparently that I wasn't aware of by, wait, Madhouse? The same folks that did that kick-ass Spawn cartoon. Holy crap, I'll be right back. Well, that was fine. Like, not bad, but yeah, stick to the manga on this one, folks. Anyway, Shigurui was based on a book by the absolutely legendary Norio Nanjo, who is, hmm, I guess sort of like the Japanese Wilbur Smith writing sensationalized and absolutely brutal historical fiction of dubious accuracy, but amazing entertainment, especially samurai yarns, and was in turn written and drawn by Takayuki Yamaguchi, who I've never heard of before, but I really should try and find more stuff by. And by the way, you should all read Wilbur Smith especially his older stuff, especially, especially River God and the Leopard Hunts in Darkness. Oh, and As a Falcon Flies. You know what, just read all Wilbur Smith's stuff before the Ghost Writers came in. Wait, where was I? Oh right, Shigurui. It's interesting how the entire thing is structured in scenes and acts, much like a Japanese period play, only with more blood. It's also one hell of a story, so let's get started. Our story opens with its epilogue, something else quite common in Japanese plays, showing Tokugawa Tadanaga, who, yeah, by all historical accounts, was a much maligned and immensely tragic figure in real life, but here, kind of mean-spiritedly, is reimagined as a sort of Japanese Caligula. He's being executed. We'll learn why over the course of the story, and at this point, just let me say this much. Shigurui may be one of the most brutal things I've ever covered and I'll likely ever cover on this channel. I would say it's more disturbing than Berserk, and is actually close to the pitch black magnificence of Blade of the Immortal in terms of sheer nastiness, and somehow goes beyond it in sheer gore. Now that I think about it, it actually has a fair bit in common with that manga too. If I were to describe it, I would say that it's Rurouni Kenshin by way of Blade of the Immortal, with a dash of Vagabond and Shamor, simmered in the contents of an abattoir. So yeah, 
This means that I cannot really show you too much of this manga. And not just because these in a nutshell videos aren't deep dives at all. About half of this manga is so bloody, so booby, and almost pornographically detailed that even censored, I would be reluctant to upload many panels. We'll do our best, but I'll say this right off the bat. If you enjoy any of those stories I just mentioned, or if you enjoy samurai stories or swordsmanship stories and your tastes run to the red, well, you've probably already read this, and if you haven't, go and track it down immediately. Anyway, turns out that Tadanaga declared a swordsmanship tournament. However, rather than having contestants battle with wooden swords or even blunted blades, as was customary for the era as to not waste your troops, he insisted on it being done with real weapons and that fights should be to the death, with several of his retainers committing seppuku in protest and in an attempt to slake his bloodlust, but wound up being to his morbid enjoyment. Yeah, unlike in reality, the Tarunaga of this story is one sick puppy, and believe me, as you will see, I am only scratching the surface here. We meet one of the competitors, the one-armed samurai Genosuke, and his bird Mie. Oh, Mie, we'll get to you in a bit. As well as his rival, the blind, crippled, disheveled-looking swordsman Seigen, and his woman Iku. Yes, we will come to know all of these characters pretty well as the story progresses. And as you'll see in a bit, this manga takes place over three time periods for the most part, not counting backstory stuff. We've got events that transpired at a swordsmanship school in the distant past, what happened after these events, and then the tournament itself which we will cut back and forth from throughout the story, and yes, we do eventually see the conclusion in the final volume of the manga. Before these two can fight, we go back in time to see what led up to this point. At the aforementioned swordsmanship school, and we meet a much younger and still two-armed Genosuke, bullying the hell out of weaker pupils. Yeah. As you might have guessed, this isn't exactly the kind of story with good guys and bad guys. It's more a story with bad guys and really bad guys. Even our, well, the closest thing to a protagonist we're going to get, is kind of a massive prolapsed dickhole. We also meet the big weird bastard Gonzaemon, and this dude... Yeah, he is a bit of a cipher to start, but when you eventually learn his backstory, oof, that might actually be one of the bleakest and most stomach-churning parts of this manga, and that's saying a lot. Soon, there's a newcomer at the dojo. Meet Griffith, I mean Sephiroth, I mean uh, Sagan. And yes, he's kind of that character. You'll see what I mean. As, well, narrative causality, essentially. The newcomer Sagan is bloody strong, knows some pretty sneaky secret techniques, and wipes the floor with Genosuke, but the much stronger Gonzaemon is able to deal with him. We meet Mie, daughter of Kogan, the master of the school who he has a thing for. Mie, I mean not Kogan, but Genosuke is common born so he doesn't really fancy his chances. We also see that, yeah, if the features didn't give it away, Seigen isn't exactly on the up and up. He's actually come here primed to seduce Mie by impressing Kogan, as whoever marries her will inherit the school and Kogan's rank which, yes, was one of the few routes available for a serf to become something more. Yeah, like, honestly, all three of the main characters, 
Ginosuke, Gonzaemon, and Seigen have got rather a lot of nuance and shades of grey to them, although it might be more shades of black in this thing. But enough of that, it's time to meet Kogan. Oh, Kogan. This guy is a vibe. We're introduced to him as he prepares to judge whether Seigen can or cannot join his school, and it doesn't take too long to realize that this man has some serious squirrels in the attic. By which I mean he's bug nuts insane, frequently abusing and hurting his students, often without any provocation or even reason. But because he's a full-blood samurai and an impossibly strong swordsman, he gets to do what the hell he wants. Just one evil bastard really evil. How evil, you ask? Well, you'll see what I mean when you read this thing. Later, after a good amount of time has passed, we see that Sagan is… yeah. Not exactly the good guy. He's both kind of a scoundrel and a massive horn dog. And we also see that Korgan has gotten even crazier, mutilating Gonzaemon's face and giving him a Glasgow smile on a whim. He also treats his consort, Iku, even worse. And yes, I'm sure that you can guess where part of the story at least is going now. Regardless, Ginosuke grows increasingly envious of the beautiful and impossibly skilled swordsman Seigen, leading the two to become rivals, and Korgan begins sending them on increasingly dangerous missions to determine which of the pair is more powerful and thus worthy of his daughter. Why not send Gonzaemon? Well, we learn that later in Gonzaemon's backstory and Huh. <sighs> Let's say he's a eunuch and leave it at that. By which I mean he turned himself into a eunuch, no I can't show you any of that. Ginosuke does do well for himself, but he's unable to eclipse the mysterious man, which makes him all the more resentful. Oh right, we also learn quite a bit more about Iku, the master's unfortunate consort who he always mistreats, but is also insanely jealous about, as well as, you know, howling at the moon insane most of the time. And we also learn that she became increasingly isolated, after Korgan began secretly killing anyone, even dogs, that show too much interest in her, to the point that nobody wanted to associate with her at all, as they believed she was cursed. We also learn a bit about Seigen's ignoble and bizarre backstory, which, uh, yeah, again, complicated. And while Seigen does eventually win Mad Korgan's approval, causing him to literally throw Mie at him, demanding children, before he, in a genuinely unpleasant sequence, attempts to force the two to consummate their marriage in front of him and the entire school which Seigen, to his credit, does manage to prevent. And yeah, there are very few panels here that I would be comfortable putting up on YouTube, you'll see what I mean. It's uncomfortable. Meanwhile, Ginosuke accidentally stumbles onto Korgan's most secret and powerful technique. And we also learn why Seigen is doing all of this, maybe. Aside from his hatred of samurai and the nobles, his mother is an old prostitute and he wants to take care of her. However, we also learn that Seigen is kind of unstable, and despite Mie, has been banging Iku throughout all of this, which Korgan later learns of via a dream. Don't overthink it. Portents and the like are common in this sort of samurai story, and after he determines this, he mutilates one of her breasts in another very uncomfortable sequence. Sure enough, 
as you'd likely expect, the other students, but particularly the fanatical and now seriously everyone in the story is bonkers Gonzayamon to declare a mission of vengeance against Sagan. They do this by isolating him and luring him to a secluded location under the guise of being inducted into the secret technique where Ginosuke beats him using said technique. And of course, it all turns out that this was a plan to betray and punish Seigen before gelding him, look it up. But Iku takes the punishment instead and severely burns her other breast with the hot iron. Seigen is able to escape, but Korgan cuts him down, revealing that the technique that Ginosuke used was only partially complete and Seigen winds up blinded and exiled, ending Act 1. By the way, we're only three volumes deep into 15 here, folks. Act 2 and Act 3 kind of run together. We see that Ginosuke has become bloody strong and is now a full instructor of Korgan style swordsmanship. He also finally gets together with Mie, but we don't learn about that until much later. Korgan, of course, has gotten even crazier, and someone has started assassinating Korgan disciples, easily cutting down even the strongest ones. I wonder who it could be. Yup. Seigen's back, and I am not even going to try and explain this, because we'd be here all day, but it makes a kind of sense. He now has his own version of the secret Korgan technique, that, while bonkers and bizarre, might be even stronger. A lot of other things happen here. Seigen continues to hunt Korgan's school, Korgan, Gonzaemon, and Genosuke hunt for him, we realize that Iku followed him and he wound up at a strange guild of blind people with a surprising amount of resources and pull with the nobility, provoking a war between the guild of the blind and Korgan's school. This does lead to some pretty awesome fights, and we get to see Korgan square off against Seigen at last. Yeah, by the way, Act 2 is where the art in this thing goes from kind of meh to really, really good. Naturally, again, narrative causality, this ends with Seigen killing Korgan in an absolutely incredible scene that, like so much of this manga, I cannot show you. Seriously, the panels would be one great big box of censorship. Ginosuke and Gonzaemon train themselves up and eventually they face Seigen directly in a duel. Ginosuke loses, costing him an arm, and Gonzaemon is killed, but Seigen winds up with his foot mutilated and quite a few other injuries. Yes, I am skipping over a lot here. This is not a short manga, but rest assured that it is absolutely worth reading. Lots and lots of great character stuff that I'm skipping over. For instance, Seigen, despite his flaws, turns over something of a new leaf and attempts to be more of a good person, for instance, showing compassion to a street kid. And that brings us, after a fairly roundabout route, to the start of the story again with Tadanaga's tournament. And we at last get to see, in the final volume of the manga, the two swordsmen face off a last time. And yeah, you probably know the ending going in here, or at least the conclusion of the fight. But as for where things wrap up, you know, if I said bittersweet, even that would be a lie. Bleak would be a better word. Depressing and sad. But tonally, that's, well, this sort of story. And if you're into this sort of thing, it works like gangbusters. Rest assured, this one is going to stay with you. So, that's Shigurui. If you can track it down, I would consider it to be something of a must-read. It's good, it's 
gorgeously drawn. It's one of the goriest things I've read in a very long time, and it is one hell of a ride all the way through. If you like your stories a bit more grounded and are a fan of the era, go and track this thing down. Just keep in mind that only those with very strong stomachs need apply. This can be one dark, sick puppy of a manga at times, but it almost never crosses over into squick the way uh, similar manga do, which is a definite positive. Next week... Something a bit different and a lot scary. Until then, before we finish for the day, I want to give a huge thanks, as always, to my fantastic patrons. Jake Reagan, Piece of Yeast, El Espresso, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, Question Man 6, Kel Kor, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, Opinion Custard, Wargle, Inukie Koji, Rose Montgomery, Lance Gobel, Paul Norberger, Rafferty, Aaron Arnold, The Hedgehog Gamer, Simone, XTC Pill, B Empress, Jake, Ranger Danger, and Cheshire Quill. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know the drill. All that good YouTube stuff. If you want to hear me say your name, get early access to most of my videos, have some fun perks on the Discord, and, you know, help us out or buy Baby Owl the necessaries, and ensure that I can keep on doing what I do into 2024, why not take a look at our Patreon? If you want to chit-chat about, well, basically anything, drop by our Twitch. We generally stream on Sunday mornings and afternoons, or you could always head over to our Discord. Take care, my friends, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.